And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here ends the first lesson. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. This morning's second lesson comes from 1 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. For one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you do wrong and are beaten for it, you take it patiently? But if when you do right and suffer for it, you take it patiently, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he trusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. Here ends the second lesson. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus began, again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not heed them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for you lead us all our lives. As you call us by your spirit, you lead us through all the valleys and the peaks of life. You are with us. Lord, by our faith, by the Spirit's call, the gift that you draw us to yourself through your word, let us to know your voice. Let us not only know your voice, but be listening, be hearers 
and indeed be doers of it as well, be doers of your word. Help us to be leaders that would bring others, leading them to you, so that you may lead all your creation to your kingdom. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, who is our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. You know, I really do believe, as disciples of Christ, that we are all called to be leaders, leading others to Christ. And if you stop and think about the Great Commission, that's precisely what our baptismal ministry is all about, bringing others to Christ as the Spirit has led us. It's kind of like being conduits in in many ways. I've learned a lot of things over the years about doing things here. I've learned how to do PVC, uh, piping, and all. uh, Not real good, I'll grant you, but uh, I, I can, you know, I can kill a nail with anybody these days, that's for sure. But I have learned quite a few things, and one of the words that I have learned over the years is what a conduit is. You know, it's that It's that stuff that they use to put wires through. It's making sure that something gets from one place to another. That's what a conduit is. And so in many ways, and and if you're going to pull a wire through it, right, you've got to have some kind of leader to run it through. Now, of course, Jesus is the, not just the good shepherd, the great shepherd, leading us through the, the, the dark places to the light. And I always kind of think of that as I reflect on this particular text. In preparing for today's sermon, I came across an article published in Stars and Stripes magazine back in 2012. Those of you who don't know, Stars and Stripes is kind of uh, an umbrella uh, publication uh, serving the military community at large. And has been doing so, goodness gracious, I think at least since World War II. And I came across an article talking about leadership, and it was particularly focused on some Navy leadership and some issues that they were having in the Navy, but it it talked about something called the Bathsheba Syndrome. I I have to say, the minute I saw that title, I was more than just a, a little intrigued. And so it mentions this in terms of the top brass in the Department of the Navy, trying to discover a cause for misconduct among some of its senior leadership. And how could the Navy decide, uh, or or stem the tide rather, of of all of these offending commanding officers, the people that had gotten very high up in leadership in the Navy. So one suggested perhaps, I don't know if you remember, uh, you know, about 20 years ago, and I was describing this to some of the kids last week, Remember the, the, the old wristbands, WWJD? Do you remember what that stood for? What would Jesus do? Well, it was interesting because in this article they were talking about how the Navy could do this is, is WWDD. What did David do? And I, and I thought that was kind of an odd approach. They're, obviously, they're talking about King David in this case. He of Old Testament legend, one famed for slaying the great Philistine Goliath the all-powerful, or at least so-seeming, leader of ancient Israel, was known for lots of things, of course, but also a stunning moral lapse in judgment. Sending one of his top soldiers, in fact, his very top soldier, Uriah, off to die, in essence, so that he could possess Uriah's wife. And her name was Bathsheba. Now this might seem like an unlikely cautionary tale for the military to embrace. But this so-called Bathsheba syndrome has gained some sense of currency within the Navy in the past few years in its attempt to curtail uh, commander misconduct. Now, interestingly enough, it, the whole idea is actually borrowed from a business journal article that was published in 1993, and this is the title, The Bathsheba Syndrome, Ethical Failures of Successful Leaders, and it was published, like I said, back in 93. 
and it asserts that the ethical failures of leaders is not, and this is the author's words here, not the result of low morals, but a byproduct of success. I have to say, I started pulling on my goatee about that point. I read a little bit more. And we're the author of, or one of the co-authors of the article, a man by the name of Dean Ludwig, a, a business professor at a, at a university, uh, said this quote, offered this quote, anytime someone is promoted into a leadership position, it can engender a sense of privilege, a sense of power, and the ability to cover one's tracks. And I got to thinking about that, and the whole idea of what this article seems to be proposing and I, yeah, I gotta tell you I disagree a little bit with that I mean there is I mean there's a lot of perhaps truth in there but I, I would suggest that in fact the lapse in judgment is due to something we're all very familiar with sin of course replacing God's law with our own sense of right and wrong is the challenge now, I would have you, and just mentally for a second, if you would, think back to the very last verse of the book of Judges. Now, if you think, of course, Israel is led by Moses almost all the way into, but we remember Moses doesn't make it into the promised land because of his own uh, issues and sin. And so it was Joshua that leads Israel into the promised land. And for a while, Israel is led by a group of people called the Judges. Now, Israel is fighting really hard to, look, to be like all the other kings. It's like a, a typical kid, right? You know, we want what the other kids have. And that's precisely where we kind of end the book of Judges. You've got Joshua telling us about how Israel moves in to the promised land. And then the Judges is those first years uh, as Israel kind of matures, as you will. And so they start to say, hey... Uh, how come we want a king like the other kingdoms do? We want, we, want to, we want to have the same toys all the other big kids have. And so Samuel, who is the prophet, the last of the judges too, Samuel is a little offended by this, but God says, Samuel, don't worry about it because they're, really, they're not really criticizing you. They are angry. They are not understanding me. So... It, it, this becomes one of those kind of Chinese proverb times. Better watch what you ask for because you just might get it. God says, you want a king? Okay, I'll give you a king. And it didn't work out real well. Saul doesn't exactly become the, the great beneficent leader that everyone hoped he would. Well, he looked good and strong and he, he was a heck of a military leader. Unless you stop and think about that whole Philistine thing where it ends up needing a little boy named David to come in and help out with that. So eventually what happens is the anointing that God had placed on Saul gets moved over to David. And we all remember what David does as a child, right? He grows up as a shepherd. I mean, where else did he get such good aim with those rocks in the first place? He had a little bit of experience, to be sure. Eventually, David becomes a king. In fact, if you look at all the kings, you might say, well, David is the best of all the kings Israel ever has, the most beneficent, the most loving. But even still, David has his challenges, including that little episode with Uriah and Bathsheba. The common metaphor for leaders in Israel was a shepherd. And yes, the only problem was that the kings didn't exactly have hearts of shepherds. So I, again, as I was thinking through the text for today, I stumbled across uh, another point out, a uh, point that is made by another prophet, this time in the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 34, where another prophet is trying to get the leaders of Israel to understand where they had gone sideways. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel in chapter 34, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. And who is he talking about with the leadership? 
prophesy, say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Koamar Adonai. That was when you knew it was a prophet speaking through the Lord, uh, from God. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Well, that's not going to end well. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. And so they were scattered. Because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains. And on every high hill, my sheep were scattered over the face of the earth. With none to search or seek for them. Obviously, there's a time where the earthly kingdom of Israel comes to an end. The shepherds were not good. They had not led the shepherd with the heart of the good shepherd. Indeed, God desired to restore his leadership. So, well, if, <laughs> if you can't get somebody else to do something right, you've got to do it yourself. And so that's precisely what God does. He sends his son. Jesus, of course, is sent and becomes the truest vision of real leadership. For he is the good shepherd. All the leaders prior, be they political or even religious, seem to be charlatans. Seeking not the blessing of the people, but to protect their place in society. And that becomes even true among the religious elite in Jesus' day. I mean, let's look at the text around Jesus, around our text for today. It's interesting because you know, chapter 10 seems to be sandwiched in between two very interesting incidents, and both of them have to do with healing someone else, with caring for the needs of someone else. In chapter 9, of course, we see in John, where Jesus heals the man born blind. And the Pharisees have a hard time with that, of course, because he's healing on the Sabbath. And then there's this question of who's really hearing. Do they hear? Are they seeing? Are they blind? Well, certainly the Pharisees believe they see. But Jesus questions even that. He said, now even that you say you see, you are truly blind. And of course, in chapter 11, we see another healing story. Jesus goes to Bethany. And I, I also kind of stumbled across something else this week. A little reminder of who Jesus is with. Jesus spends an awful lot of time in the town of Bethany. That's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live. They are close friends. And it dawns on me what that word means. Beit Ani. House of the poor. You see, a good shepherd connects with all of them. Not just the highest, but indeed, perhaps even more with the lowliest. So Jesus goes to Beit Ani to heal Lazarus. And again... The religious elite of Israel have a problem. But now it's even worse because Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. Many more are now convinced that he is the Messiah. And for that, well, we can't have another messianic uprising. The, what would the Romans do? They feared the reprisal. So what does the chief priest of the, of the day say? Caiaphas gets up and says, It is better for one man to die than for the entire nation to perish. Hmm. Sounds like somebody trying to protect his position in society. Yet Jesus is, and that's the one thing, if I could expand this text just by one verse. I'm not asking for much here. Just by one little verse. Can we expand it out to, to verse 11, please? Maybe I should write a letter to the people who, who, who do that, that lectionary. Chap verse 11 just at the end of it, beyond one verse beyond our text for today. I am the good shepherd. What does the good shepherd do? He lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus doesn't come to be an earthly king. 
And so that it makes it that much more important that Jesus does lay down his life. But the great part is he doesn't just lay it down. This is Easter, is it not, friends? And he picks it right back up again. For us and for our salvation, the Nicene Creed reminds us. He comes as a lowly shepherd tending his flock. And that humble yet protective voice is still familiar because it is received by faith a gift of God's grace through the Holy Spirit. You want truth? Here's the truth. All human leadership is bound to fail simply because it is that. It is human. And therefore, it is sinful. In God's plan, Jesus comes to reveal true leadership. The good leader, the good shepherd, leads the flock into pastures where the green grass grows, where the still waters flow, and where the valleys become dark and brooding. He still leads on. It's one of my favorite hymns. Jesus still leads on till the rest is won. Jesus is leading us because he is the good shepherd. He leads us through the dark into the light. All of those leaders who had come before Jesus, he made uh, that point pretty clear. They were all simply thieves and robbers used by the ruler of this world. That ruler, of course, is a thief that our text reminds us comes to steal and kill and destroy. The very antithesis of Christ, mm, the anti-Christ. But Jesus, who is the Christ, has come with life And that abundantly, eternally. Yes, the good shepherd does lay down his life for the sheep. But in this great Easter moment, he takes it up again, showing us that sin and death and Satan have met their match. And that offers us hope as well. So we have nothing to fear, particularly in getting what is coming to us. The good news is that we don't get what we have coming to us as indeed forgiven sinners. We have what we deserve, no, but what we receive by grace. We await the kingdom of God. This is the abundant life that Christ shares. So we, as disciples of Christ, walking in our baptismal ministry, receiving this meal, the bread of life, the blood that forgives us, that brings us closer, where we become what we, what we eat, the body and blood of Christ, working and leading in this life, but most importantly, through our actions and through our words, leading others to our good shepherd as he leads us all home. That is the best news of all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us take a moment to reflect on that word of God and the will.